Bitchers. Welcome, Welcome to, to Movie, Movie Bitches. Bitches. Hitchcock Tober. Part two. First things first, shout out to our Patreon supporters. $5 a month gets you early access. $10 gets you access to our viewing party. <laughs> second thing, second, ooh, second shing second. I turned into Sean Connery. We did that last week. Sean I gotta... Connery, you know, the old money Philadelphia. And yes, it sounded very that. Very that. Well, you know, it's because of my, my tuxedo that was, you know, I'm sexy Bond. Slutty Bond? Slutty, slutty Bond. Slutty, isn't, slutty Bond. Isn't Bond just slutty though? Well, maybe he's a little more discreet in his attire about it. Fair. He's a secret <laughs> slut. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm assuming that you do not know who I am. No, but those glasses are about to send me into a fit of rage strangling you, but... <laughs> I'm the log lady from Twin Peaks, which you have not watched, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, if you look... The you show know, or the movie? The show. I mean, she's... Okay. It's a... The, sh- the movie is a continuation of said show, and then subsequently they made a oh. new show. So, all, all of the above. But my log, yeah. my log has something to tell you. Second thing, second. Ah, shout out to our wine sponsor, Wink. Go to trywink.com slash moviebitches. You get $22 off your first month of logs. I mean wine. Oh, right. Log, log, log. Sorry, now I'm just going through 90s log references. Um, anyway. It's log, log, log. It's log, log. It's big, it's heavy, it's boy. Third things third. Make sure to subscribe, share, ho. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Now, if only Cher had been able to be in a Hitchcock movie, I just can't even imagine what oh. that would be like. Oh. Well, because it would have had to have been, I mean, just like, if we're not living in a fantasy world where one of them's a zombie, it would have had to have been when she was very young. So. Very young. Here for it? Right? <laughs> very much here for it. When did he die? 70. Cher was probably about 200 or, or maybe 250 years old at that time. Right, right, so. right, right. Just, just um, <laughs> aging uh, into a century or so, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the silly thing that was going around about Cher being a vampire. I mean, that just tracks. I don't know. I mean, I didn't know that was like... It was like this picture of her as like a fully grown woman with a eight-year-old Janet Jackson. And you're like... But she looks the same now. What? And it was very much like, Sempre vive. <laughs> Live forever. You know, that's what I tweeted back at it. Because it was just like, what is this? This is crazy. <laughs> like, Janet Jackson is now, I mean, an elderly woman. I don't know how old this is Janet Jackson. 60 something. I would say somewhere between 50 and 80. I, I, I don't know. I do not know. Yeah. Now, also, I don't know if this would have been really possible either. I guess she would have been very young, too, but like Eliza Minnelli in a Hitchcock. Oh, I mean, I think it would maybe an infant. I mean, Liza was in, um, uh, what's that Van Johnson, Judy movie, the good old fashioned summertime, something with words about, and, the, and mm-hmm. it's, it's just a remake of Shep Around the Corner in the good old oh. summertime, in the good, some words... Uh, things like that. She's like a a, ch- a little baby child in that movie. Liza is like eighty something, so she had to have been That's like, when did true. Cabaret come out? Wait, so is well, Liza's older than Cher, even though that seems impossible. She How old to. is Cher? It's not going to have an answer for you. It'll just say Cher is eternal. Seventy five, but it should just be like unknown. <laughs> Age How old is Liza Minnelli? Seventy five. What? Wait, do they have the same birthday? Wait, did we just uncover something? When was Liza Minnelli born? March 12th, 1946. A little Pisces. When was Cher born? May 20th, 1946. Okay. So Liza is like a month and a half older than Cher. So technically I was correct. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but so there we go. Either of them could easily have been in a Hitchcock movie. As very young women. A 20-year-old, you know, in the 60s. Yeah. The same as um, Timmy Hedren. Oh, sure, yes. Or sure, yeah. Well, anyway. Now, how old is Shirley MacLaine? Wouldn't it be crazy um, if, like, 1946 was, like, the year of divas? The year. Where they were just all born? <laughs> I feel like she's older, but, you know, I don't know. Probably. When was Shirley MacLaine born? 34. Okay, so about a decade older. She's 87. Okay. When was Jane Fonda born? No, she's 80-something, no. too. 37. Divas. Weird. They come in pairs. I don't know. 
Anyway. anyway, here we are for part two of Hitchcocktober. We're going to talk about Hitchcock and homoeroticism. I'm excited. Hitchcock and cock. <laughs> Hitchcock. That's just what it is. Oh. So today we'll be talking about rope and Strangers on a Train, yeah. two of my favorite Hitchcock movies. Well, wow. I mean, I guess, um, oh, well, I guess we'll find out. Uh, Strangers on a Train is is sort of famously one of his better ones. Uh, people tend to be divided on rope, but... Including him. He apparently yes. said that it yes. disappeared for a while and he was fine with that. Well, it was an experiment, right? And so sure. looking back at it now, well, let's talk about it. So Rope from 1948. Starring yeah. Farley Granger, Jimmy Stewart, and John Dahl, who s steals this fucking movie. You know I'd never do anything unless I did it perfectly. Right. Steals it, I think. Well, isn't it his to have? Well, I mean, when you're in a movie with Jimmy Stewart and you're John Dahl, I feel like, you know. I don't think you appreciate me, Philip. I'm beginning to, Brenda. But Jimmy Stewart's in it for five minutes. Well, we'll get into the Jimmy Stewart of it all. So Rope, yes, we will. <laughs> uh, based on a play that was uh, much more homoerotic in the play. Much yeah, they more... were explicitly gay in 1920s. Uh huh. One of the screenwriters for the Rope was Arthur mm -hmm. Lorenz, who I'm very excited to talk about. Wrote the book for Gypsy, for West Side Story. He wrote the screenplay for The Way We Were, for Turning Point, for um, yeah. oh. Uh, my favorite David Lean movie, Summertime, is based on a play of his. And I was like, oh, the sass makes sense. It's all making sense. Yes. And he was a homosexual. And Farley Granger and him were living lovers while this was all happening. Wow. Love that. So I was just like, oh, now a lot of this sort of subtext that's become more text as time has gone on because the Hayes office yes. didn't know what was happening. You can't have everything. And we, we did do it in the daytime. All right now, Philip? Yes? It's not very subtle now, I would say. But back then, it was it was like, no. Oh, what are they talking about? It, We're going to go right. to Connecticut, my mom's house. Don't worry about it. Ah. Philip's uh, bidding the world a temporary farewell tonight. I I'm driving him up to Connecticut after the party. Oh, where are you going? Just to Brandon's mother's place for a few weeks. Right? <laughs> I mean, I loved this. Like, I loved that it was so explicitly, to me, it was pretty explicitly gay. How queer. I never heard of anyone who didn't eat chicken. Did you, Brandon? Oh, you probably did. I just don't. Well, now, there must be a reason. Freud says there's a reason for everything. They never said that they were lovers, but they definitely implied that they did everything together. <laughs> and that's where I think... In some ways, casting Farley Granger in Strangers on a Train... Confusing. A little bit more, it right? A little, it's not a little the more, same... Um, well, I think you can, you can dissect and read into things. Yes, you can. A little bit more. I had two fun little revelations about Hitchcock in watching these two. One was obviously his obsession with, like, tantalizing older women with the topic of murder. Oh, I'm so obsessed with his old biddies. Obsessed with them. I know, right? They're everything, and I love them. <laughs> You're so silly. I'm just an independently wealthy woman who's living her best life. Here's my jewels and oh, murder. You know, it's amazing. I love it. <laughs> oh, I'm scandalized. I mean, we're getting way ahead, but well, it's okay. When Bruno is like, oh, I'm not interested in murder. Oh, come now. Everyone's interested in that. Everyone is, likes to talk about murder, and she's like, no, nobody talks about it. Basically, I realized with the homoeroticism of all of the, especially these two movies, you could really replace murder with sodomy or gay sex or whatever oh, yes. you wanted to call it. Sure. And that's basically just a, you know, it's like, oh, we murdered David's David. bussy. There you go. Well, it's. <laughs> It's also very much connecting sex and violence in general. Well, you know, I of mean, course. Brandon is coming in his pants while they're, I mean, right? Open it. He's Mr. Goopy Pants for this entire play, right? I mean, oh 
Sorry, Batty? I never want to hear that phrase ever again. Okay. Well, it's just from David Schmader. What am I supposed to do? Okay, Mr. Goopy Pants. So I would say, yeah. for me, yes. I would recommend mm -hmm. both of these films. I think they both are fascinating and there's so much cool technically going on. And I, I really love yes. a lot of the performances. I really like both these movies. I would recommend them. What about you? I agree. I had a lot more fun with Strangers on a Train. Rope was, I don't want to say painful. It, it was cringy okay. the whole time. And so dark. It is a bleak, cold, aloof. He thinks murder is a crime for most men, but a privilege for the few. Yes. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little sicker than you. I love it. I love John Dahl in, in this movie. Now the fun begins. So Rope, basic outline. Yes. Based on a play that was sort of loosely based on the Leopold and Loeb murder trial of, of reality, where two men murder a schoolmate, another man, and the implications of their interpersonal relationships and sort of class and the, that this idea that if you're better than someone else, you deserve or, or should be able to murder them because they're unworthy of living, essentially. Right. And oh, it is dark. <laughs> I've always wished for more artistic talent. Well, murder can be an art too. The power to kill can be just as satisfying as the power to create. That's sort of the basic layout and the, the technical achievement of it all is that they did it in long takes. He wanted to see right. what he could do. Hitchcock wanted to see what he could do. Basically transferring a play to screen literally. I mean, quite literally. There's 10 right. minute takes because that's how long the magazines of film would last. Yeah. And yeah. so from a technical perspective, the idea that they were able to do so many camera moves and dolly shots and keep it yeah. interesting to me at least with these huge cumbersome cameras from 1948 and it's his first color movie. So like that's a brand right. new thing. So for me, uh, people kind of dismiss this movie as just like a technical experiment or whatever, but I think it's pretty fucking impressive. Like watching this in 48, I feel like I would have been like, oh my God, what are they, oh how are they doing this with the camera and the wires? Sure. And it was sure. all choreographed. It was all this play because they had to do it in real time. and so they would ruin takes because they'd get to the end of the take and there would be an electrician standing in the frame going, oh, fuck. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And they'd have to do the whole thing over. You know, he tried this also in Lifeboat, which I don't know if you've seen, but the whole movie takes place literally in a lifeboat. The entire wow. thing. It's also fabulous. You should watch it. Tallulah Bankhead is everything. Just in case you didn't already Duh. know. I thought everybody was killed. I never expected to see you alive. You know I'm practically immortal. I think for me, what made this movie bearable was the filmmaking. The pacing on both of these films is so different, but also so essential because the takes were so long. It's like a waltz. Yeah. And it never gives you time because there's no cuts or, you know, basically there's no cuts. You know, there's fake cuts. Well, there's two. I was or reading. Seamless, it was yeah. There was... The 10 minute long reels. Yeah. And then they could change out a reel and do like, oh, from his jacket, pan back up or whatever. And then at a certain time, they had to like change out the entire camera or whatever after right. like two or three of those. So there's certain hard, there's like two, I think, hard cuts or whatever it is. But right. anyway, because of that, I think you never get a chance to like check out. Your brain oh, is just constantly being are... taken from one thing to another and you're moving it's around not this apartment. boring. It is. No fully engaging and really in a way does capture that essence of live theater I think where you are engaged with the constant movement the constant changing of characters and all of that stuff because it's short but it feels yeah long enough I, I don't know how to explain it exactly oh, yeah. but <laughs> I, oh, no. I didn't want it to go on any longer <laughs> See, but I think that it does a really good job of making you feel like you are trapped. I, mean, I think that's the point, right? It makes you sure. feel like you are, it's closing in on you. There's this famous story everyone likes to reference that when Hitchcock was a child, his dad put a note in his pocket and said, go to the police station and hand them this note. And so he went and he handed it to them and they locked him in a jail cell. And the note said, like, put my son in jail to teach him a lesson he was very naughty or something like that 
And so this running theme of, I'm just an innocent man who was wrongfully accused of this thing, not in Rope, we, <laughs> that's very clear, but in Strangers on a Train, in Saboteur, right. in North by Northwest, this, this running theme of, I just got wrapped up in this thing. I'm just an average guy that got completely blindsided right. by, you know, and, and so that, that runs through it. So I think, you know, that idea of, of, of the police and the, and the law closing in on you is a running theme, obviously. There's so many parts where I am so incredibly un unnerved during this movie. And I think that's what it's doing. You know, I think it's a really good right. horror movie. It's terrifying. And the yeah. fact that they actually showed the murder is shocking, right. uh, particularly yeah. since it's two men murdering another man. Usually sure. it's always a woman. It's always right. a woman being strangled to death. We'll talk about it later. There's so many um, things going on under the surface of this movie that it, oh, yeah. For me, it feels like they're getting away with something, which I always um, deeply appreciate, uh, that, those kind of movies, where I feel like, not, not getting away with murder, where the filmmakers are getting away with, you know, the, uh, the subtext of the homosexuality, gotcha. the, all, of, all of these sure. things where they're like, fuck you to the Hays Code. I love that. Right. Anytime we can shove it up the MPAA's ass. Yeah, if I'm, you can say, <laughs> right up your bum, MPAA. I like it. I'm yeah. a fan. So, I mean, it starts off and you're in it, and it's it starts off with a bang, right? It I mean, like literally, we hear him scream, and he is being strangled, and then they stick him in the tr trunk. John and... Dahl comes in his pants, and Farley Granger has had a nervous breakdown. That is yes. where we're at. Don't. I mean, this movie is fascinating, and there's so much that you can talk about, and. For me, what I found to be really interesting was that almost in both of these by the end, but especially this one, especially I think it's an interesting choice to have uh, Jimmy Stewart be like the one who, well, I mean, his character is bizarre. Cut her throat weak, <laughs> strangulation day. <laughs> I really don't appreciate this morbid humor. Well, the humor was unintentional. You know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington like wholesome guy one, be like, George well, Bailey. everyone should be able to murder whoever they want, but also then to be the one to save the day and, and send them to the police to get justice or yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's equally fascinating that Jimmy Stewart, to me, is completely miscast, but also maybe the perfect person. Like, it's this really weird dichotomy where he has no courage of his convictions when he's talking about... Right. You don't really approve of murder, Rupert, if I may. You may, and I do. Think of the problems it would solve. Unemployment, standing in line for theater tickets. To me, like, he, he doesn't believe what he's saying, right? That, that murder should be legalized and, and like, how, oh, how many problems would it solve if we could just murder somebody? But like, oh, but only the, the lower classes or the stupid people who didn't go to college, et cetera, et cetera. They are in the death by slow torture category, oh. <laughs> along with bird lovers, small children, and tap dancers. <laughs> Yeah. So he's no courage of his convictions, which is telling because then at the end, he's just like, oh, no, I was completely wrong. Right. I will give up everything I've been doing my entire life. You know, and you're like, oh, well, you really. You twisted my words. And it's like, no, we just heard them 20 minutes ago. Those that's what you said. After all, murder is or should be an art. Not one of the seven lively, perhaps, but an art nevertheless. But the really interesting thing is Arthur Laurent, the screenwriter, he wrote a whole memoir about, you know, Broadway and living with Farley Granger and all this stuff and writing rope. And he was like, I'm in quite a dilemma because I have to put all of this gay subtext into the movie, but I can't let the MPAA know that there's all this gay subtext in the movie. And also, I don't know if Jimmy Stewart ever realized that his character was gay. <laughs> right. I don't think he did. <laughs> oh, he definitely didn't. He had no idea, which is even <laughs> better somehow. Yeah. Rupert, I, I was beginning to think you weren't going to show. You know me better than that. But I just love the idea of him being like, I don't think he understood the assignment. Uh, <laughs> I think he missed a key point where... He was definitely fucking all of these boys in school. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> just, just so we're all on the same page. But see, actually, I don't know if he was Maybe definitely he wasn't fucking, fucking all the them. boys. But he certainly had homosexual thoughts about them, let's say that. Well, he thought about murder. It works, well, I'm telling you. Oh, it definitely works, but also I think you could say um, 
in every one of his movies, somebody is obsessed with murder or the perfect murder. Want to hear one of my ideas for a perfect murder? If you're going to kill somebody, do it simply. Am I right, Dr. Sedbisk? You're right. Just as long as you don't get caught. Which is why he was the perfect victim for the perfect murder. The best way to commit a murder... I know, I know. Hit him on the head with a blunt instrument. Well, it's true, isn't it? Do you really believe in the perfect murder? Mm. Yes, absolutely. Of course, of and, course. And that could be representative of something else that's, that's under the surface in that character. It doesn't always have to well, be right. sodomy, but I think it totally <laughs> tracks. We'll talk about the horse hooves. We'll talk about it. And, oh my God! Um, oh, those horse hooves. I, I, like talk about what was it, Mister Creamy Pants? What was it? Oh, Mister Goopy Pants. Mister Goopy Pants. You said you didn't want to hear it ever again, Andrew. I don't. The subtext of it all, of like the power of infatuation, yeah. I guess, let's say. Clearly with the Jimmy Stewart character, it's daddy issues in right. some extent. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of stuff. And also, first and foremost, let's put it down that like the gay villainry of all of this. Brandon, how did you feel? When? During it? Don't remember feeling very much of anything. Oh, gays must be sociopaths. I'm not on board for that. But there's no. a lot here that we can yeah. dissect that doesn't have to deal with all of that. Well, and I don't know. I would say, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not Hitchcock's psychologist. Of course, that's there. But as, all I would say is, as a middle schooler watching these movies, maybe that's a problem to begin with. I was so incredibly excited for any kind of representation of outsiders. I was like titillated as a child, like, oh, they're gay, how exciting is that? How can you get so excited at a time like this? I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not that I'm not titillated or anything. In this old movie? That's so cool that that's even, even subtly being represented in a movie in 1948. Sure. But 100% it's there and there's definitely, you know, some issues with the whole, you know, you must be insane uh, and, and some sort of psycho. Uh, issues, yes. Till his body went limp. And then? Then I felt tremendously exhilarated. It's all there. But but I did love, like, clearly Brandon wanted to fuck Jimmy Stewart and wanted his oh, approval and his Brandon wanted his to father fuck figure, everybody, you know, I think. Well, he wanted I think to fuck so. David. I think he wanted to fuck I think David. And David didn't, didn't and... let him, you know, I think there was a, oh, no he thanks. He had to go. Um, <laughs> He simply had to go. They had to go. And you know, Farley Granger was, um, let's say, willing. So he went with him. I think that's the relationship, right? I think Farley Granger was more than willing. I think he was so in love with him that he oh, was I know. just- From Brandon's perspective, I'm saying, I think Brandon was like, right. oh, he'll, he will fuck me? Or, well, let's be honest. I, I can fuck him? Great. Sure. Yeah. I think that's where we're at. <laughs> The sociopathy in this movie is astounding. Oh my god! Um, well, John Dahl is 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 like gleefully and delightfully psychotic. I thought he was so funny. Again, maybe I'm a very sick person. Of course, he uh, he was a Harvard undergraduate. <laughs> that might make it justifiable homicide. He's dead, and we've killed him. <laughs> what is this? In 1948, this sass but, in 1948. Yes. Yes. Yes, I love that. And and that's, you know, it's so funny. There was so much about this movie, and we, we just talked about it, and it'll probably come out in seven to eight months, but Benediction, the movie that I right. watched at TIFF, right, right. has a lot of similarities in that it was cutting, sassy, intellectual gaze looking down on the others, and that kind of vibe. They were so miserable in that movie, and yeah. honestly, probably no more explicitly gay than in this, which is kind of crazy. Wow. Because it's coming out in 2021. Wow. But, um, <laughs> right? Bravo, Arthur wow. Lorenz. Bravo. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of that like intellectual, sassy, gay, but I also feel like I know people like this. Maybe not like murderously like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, but just, it was a, let's but it's just like, say Arthur Lorenz probably, you know, drew from reality and his real yes. life experiences on Broadway in the 40s. I mean, come on, yeah, <laughs> it seems like it makes sense. Some women are, are quite charming when they're angry, Janet. Unfortunately, you're not. Oh my God, can we talk about this New York real estate, though? This apartment. We haven't even talked about <gasps> this, this apartment. apartment. And that backdrop, oh. a, a miniature. Yeah, a miniature. A giant 
a giant the, miniature. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> well, it's so big that it seems yeah, but it's tiny. And uh, this matte painting with fiberglass clouds that they had to manually move as the as the sun was setting, and they had to redo all the sunset scenes because it was just too orange. Oh no! And so they had to reshoot the last half of the movie. But then also the neon lights that start flickering as it's starting to like get oh, closer course. and the pressure. Well, did you see the cameo? Hitchcock's cameo, you know, his famous, he has to have a cameo in every movie, is yeah. a neon sign that's just his profile that you could see. They had to figure something out, right. Who could have been in this tiny cast, yeah. It's obvious for so many reasons why he gets the term master of suspense. And it's like oh. both of these, so many examples of just like, that scene with the fucking metronome. I'll ask you, what do you suspect? I don't know if that's just because I took piano lessons for so long and the metronome is the devil, or it's universal. That scene has stuck with me. I'm just like, oh my God, he's playing um, a time code that's very all over the place. And we've got this metronome that's going that he keeps making go faster and they're doing dialogue over each other and you can hear the yeah. dialogue from the other room and I'm just like, oh, yeah. No. You could have said that. All right, I didn't. We're not eating now, Philip. What'd you lie to me for? Because I don't like to talk about, about what? Strat I can't play with that thing. But he manages to know exactly the right time to break the tension for me, where the example I always use that, that is too long for me is the end of Back to the Future. The end of Back to the Future is, it makes me, yes. my skin crawl, because I'm just like, too many things have gone wrong for too long. I can't, I'm out, I can't. I can't do this anymore, I can't do it. And somehow with Hitchcock, it's exactly the apex of like, I'm gonna, yes. fuck, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Or he subverts well, where you think the surprise is coming and you go, I had no idea. Yeah, exactly. Or, right, it's like there's often tension for then no reason. Like, it's, like, it's like, oh my God, so tense. And then it meant not like the dog in Strangers on the Train and you're just like, oh my God. Oh, oh my it didn't matter. Oh, it was to distract me, I see. Right, oh. so, you know, stuff like that. I realized too, one of the, the things for me about Hitchcock, Brian helped me come up with, but because I said it was always fun in games until someone gets hurt. And Brian said, no, it's always fun in games and someone, someone gets, gets hurt. hurt. Oh yes, absolutely. It's just, it's not until, it's the whole time. It's the whole someone time. Someone gets hurt and, and it's still fun in games. And it's fun in games. Know, he's and that's, playful. Yeah. that's why I think, because I, I was really not into horror until later. I was a big old Freddy cat, but I loved Hitchcock. And I think a lot of that has to do with the releasing of tension constantly, building it up, releasing it, building it up, releasing it. And yeah. people are always having a good time. People are, are talking right. about murder and they're having a great time. And you know, that tickles a very specific part of my brain for some reason. An immaculate murder. We've killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. We're alive. Truly and wonderfully alive. We've killed for the sake of danger and killing. Like, he is on a different camp level. Like, he is... Yes. He's up here. He's camp. He's yeah. full camp. He has, a, he has, you know, he's got a permanent address. He is there at <laughs> summer camp. He's there. Oh, I was going to say, just speaking about John Dahl and how fucking great he is. If you haven't seen Gun Crazy, you've probably seen the poster. It's one of those posters that maybe it was in public domain or something. It's just like the old movie poster that's in everyone's apartment. Um, and it's like called Gun Crazy, so that's fun. Sure. It's so great. You have to, it's like the original Natural Born Killers. You have to watch it. It's so okay. amazing. It's like a total B movie and yet it's experimental and like ahead of its time. It's great. It's so great. Cool. So anyway, <laughs> that was just a sidebar about John Dahl. Well, and they were gonna originally, they wanted Montgomery Clift and Farley Granger, which would have been very interesting because they were both homosexuals. Um, yeah. And so, and I don't know if John Dahl, I didn't look into it. He, was, he wasn't obviously, um, I don't know, I didn't look. So film historians, William Mann and Karen Hansberry have remarked that Dahl was gay, but claimed in media interviews to have had a brief marriage in the early forties. No marriage certificate has come to light and his death certificate records him has never married. Hedda okay. Hopper once linked his name with Jane Withers romantically. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Hedda Hopper was just a shill, so. She, <laughs> wow. I mean, yes. According to music journalist Phil Milstein, at the time of his death, Dahl had lapsed into alcoholism oh. and was living with his partner, actor Clement Brace. Okay, so we've got the answer to that question. But yes, John Dahl was great. However, 
can we talk about the fabulous buns? Oh, we can talk all about the fabulous buns. Oh my God, in this lobster. I mean, I could see Lady Gaga wearing this now. The suit outfit with these huge shoulder things, but then the- Yeah. It had a lot going on. Joan Chandler as Janet, the bubbly, sassy, vivacious beard yes. of everyone. Be careful of my hair, it took hours. You smell dreamy, what is it? That uh, swirl you, you gave me last Christmas. I always knew I had good taste. Uh, I guess, right? She dated all three of these men? Yeah. Well, Kenneth still had gay vibes too. No, Kenneth felt maybe the most gay, I'll be honest. <laughs> I don't think anyone was gayer than... Um... <laughs> than Brandon. No. Farley Ranger? Yeah. Well, Philip was the, the only one that did not date Janet, so that tracks. That tracks, there you go, yeah. <laughs> but we've got... Edith Evanson as the maid, Mrs. Wilson. She showed up in Marnie last week. And Constance right. Collier, character actress Constance Collier as Mrs. Atwater, who's talking about star signs and oh my God. movies and her veil. And I'm not even supposed yeah. to be at this party. <laughs> right? He was living in that new thing, the Bergman. What is it called now? The something of the something. No, no, that was the other one. This was just plain something. Was it something, something, or just, just something? Something. What did you see it in? I don't quite recall the something, something. Mm. It's just something, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you wanted to know, they were talking about Notorious, which we're going to watch next Oh, week. good, love it. And Bergman. She's the Virgo type, like all these, you know. Oh, I think she's lovely. <laughs> Cary Grant and... Bergman, they were, what was it, it was something, yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> I really identified this, with that. <laughs> really, and, but this meta-ness, I thought it was very forward, yeah. you know, talking about movies in a movie that's not really about movies. You know, usually, you know, oh, no. Singing in the Rain, yeah, that's meta, they're talking about movies because they're in the movie. But this, right. you know, it, it was, it's so. Well, they're New York so, socialites. Well, of course, but it just felt so fresh talking about, Having Hitchcock write in and or Whatever. Arthur Lorenz and or Hume Crone, who adapted it to, um, talk about actors that he had worked with previously, about his right. movies. You know, it was, it was all yeah. there. It was fun. I think I like Mason as much as Errol Flynn. I'll take Cary Grant myself. Oh, so will I. Capricorn, the goat, he leaps. It was also weird to me to have Jimmy Stewart be in on that conversation where yes! they're talking about these other movies. And it was like as if now... Who are you supposed to be in this world? Like, how does, what is, okay. What's this though? What's happening here? <laughs> what? What? Who is having that conversation? <laughs> I didn't like the new girl much. Definitely Scorpio. No, I didn't like her either, but her clothes were fabulous. Simply divine. Absolute heaven. I must see it. I didn't like that new girl very much. She must be a Scorpio. I, I thought that was really funny. <laughs> oh, I didn't care for her either, but the costumes, oh. Oh my God. I'm just, costumes, I mean, it definitely the passes way. the Becknell test, by the way, in a cast where there are literally only three women. I mean, there's only like four or five guys too, but I was like, hey movie. I don't know if I agree with that in that it's men talking about men and the affections and desires to be appreciated by men, etc. No, but they but, were talking about that play that they both saw and the costumes and the woman, you know, they were talking about things that weren't work or a man, briefly. That's, they briefly discussed, they were talking about star signs. They had a whole conversation. Sure. Well, the women certainly do. I guess in that sense, like that's what I'm saying, like traditionally in the Bechtel test of like women and their dialogue, Yes, yes, but in the gay men talking about, it's mostly about men and, and wanting, and subtext so whatever at least, the reverse, wanting the desire and affection and approval of a, a, a man. Whatever the opposite of the Bechdel test is, doesn't... Yes, the, the gay Bechdel test the Lem didn't, didn't pass. Beck test? I was trying to do it backwards, I can't do it that fast. But oh. anyway, I also thought it was so incredibly fascinating that they have an entire discussion about Hitler in 1948. Good and evil, right and wrong, were invented for the ordinary average man, the inferior man, because he needs them. And obviously you agree with Nietzsche and his theory of the Superman. Yes, I do. So did Hitler. Broad worldview discussion about Hitler, not just, oh, propaganda, or, oh, that asshole, or whatever. Like, they have a, right. a whole conversation around it. Um, and I was like, oh, this is so 
fresh for 1948. Sure. Hitler was a, a paranoid savage. His supermen, all fascist supermen, were brainless murderers. I'd hang anywhere left. But then you see, I'd hang them first for being stupid. They weren't smart enough to pull it off. Damn, Brandon. Well, either were you, Brandon. No. This kind of goes back to what you were saying last week about the Hitchcockiness of it, where it's like, you know, dealing with murder and it's still fun. And like the, the father, like the external figures or whatever, there's always someone who kind of leavens it up. I can close the middle. And there's nobody to tell me that the results are anything but brilliant. So I live in a comfortable glow of self-appreciation. I felt like with this, it was really interesting too. It kind of takes these heady upper crust conversations and dinner parties yep. and pushes them to like their farthest conclusion. What if it got really crazy? And like, what if they actually did it, you know? Yes. And it kind of gives you a way of experimenting with that and seeing where it goes so that you can then be like, oh no, no, I would never do that. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm, I'm sane. I'm a human. Like, I have humanity oh, still. It was I a, don't hate everyone that much. I would not, I would not murder someone like a, just a, because a litmus, he's... A litmus test. A little How bit. much do you identify with Brandon? How much? <laughs> what's your scale from sass to murder? What's the, what's the you know... <laughs> dead center? I don't know, you know? That's great. It's a very, very <laughs> aloof movie. It's very British in that way, I feel like. It's very sure. removed. It feels, and the play was, I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I do believe it was it was British originally, like it, it played in, in London. And so it feels removed and cold and aloof in that way that, yeah. that British murder mysteries are. Like this, I think, is the closest we'll ever get to like Hitchcock doing Agatha Christie. You know, it's a locked room murder essentially, but sure. from a completely different angle. And, and just so fucked up. I mean, so fucked up. I mean, so they, like, they murder, we haven't even really talked about it. They murder David, stuff his yeah. body in a trunk in the middle of this fabulous New York apartment. And then they serve dinner essentially on his body. I mean, this is like some Titus Andronicus shit. This is like some next level mm. fucked up shit. And they invite uh -huh. his the murder victim's parents. Parents and fiance? Fiance. Girlfriend? And then Brandon, of course, also invites their professor who gave them the idea and maybe right. a few more ideas your touch has improved philip rupert <laughs> yeah thanks for the thanks for the visualization yeah. <laughs> i think my favorite um sequence in this movie though is so the dinner party is winding down there's been highs there's been lows People are ready to leave. They're a little drunk. And Miss Wilson is cleaning up the trunk, cleaning up the dinner table. Right. And we get yes. this great shot. This movie does a really great job of claustrophobic close-ups where dialogue is happening and you just you just see the person you need to see who's reacting to what's going on. And so you, you really feel it all. But this shot is just Jimmy Stewart's back, um, half in the frame. And Miss Wilson slowly taking things off the trunk, bring them to the dining room. He does this the best. You, the audience, are going, oh no, they're gonna get found out. But oh no, once she takes that second candlestick off, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all over there. She's just gonna open right. the trunk and you're going, oh no, oh my God, stop talking, turn around. And you're going, wait, they murdered him. I want them to open the trunk, right? Oh no. I'll help you with that, Miss. Oh, thank you, Mr. Cadet. There, yeah, that's all right, Mrs. Wilson. You can put the books back when you come in to clean in the morning. I did, but at the same time you don't because you don't want the family to like then see his murdered body sitting in the trunk that they've been eating dinner off of the whole time. Well, I think it does a great job of we don't see that scene, right? That would that would be too sad. The mom exactly. doesn't the mom doesn't come to the party because happenstance, right. so the aunt the fluky aunt gets to come. So you don't feel as sad. It's not as yeah. like somehow they really ride the line where you can keep enjoying it and not just go, oh fuck. And I don't know, to be honest, how much for me, I, I feel like I was on one side of the line where I was just like, Great. oh God, well, but, but yes. But like I said, the filmmaking keeps you in it. You know, it starts off and you're repulsed. We've killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. That's irredeemable. And like now what, you know, but 
it keeps moving and the camera keeps moving and everything keeps moving. And so like anytime, it's been 10 minutes before there was any chance for you to pause and want to just be like, oh, I'm going to turn this off because it keeps moving and moving and moving. Yeah, yeah. And I think that really keeps the pace and the keeps the audience bought in. Oh, yeah. Without me just being like, I can't with this. I don't want to watch any more of this sociopathic nonsense. And so then you still get stuck in it. And then by the end, finally, obviously, it's like, this is terrible. You're a, a sociopath and you deserve to go to jail. Well, see, and but, then you're like, okay, good. I'm okay, not crazy. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm more fucked up than you. But I feel like the ending is a total like, oh, they didn't, they didn't pull the trigger he's just gonna renounce everything he thought he believed it a man should stand by his words but you've given my words a meaning that i never dreamed of and you've tried to twist them into a cold logical excuse for your ugly murder i think it's more interesting if jimmy stewart has a moment of i did this i compelled them and have this god complex of they did this because of me, because they worship me. Right. Like if he had had a moment of that and maybe even a moment of, ooh, I like this. And then, and oh no, I mean, oh my God. I think that's, that. maybe I'm sick, but that's just so much more deliciously like, oh no. <laughs> there must have been something deep inside you from the very start that let you do this thing. But there's always been something deep inside me that would never let me do it. What's interesting about that is that to me, that's where it would have gone if he wasn't Jimmy Stewart and realized that his character was subtextually character homosexual <laughs> and, and also potentially sociopathic or whatever. Like, if this person, and that's what was so weird, is that it's such a, a quick 180 for this character. I mean that tonight you've made me ashamed of every concept I ever had of superior or inferior beings. To at a dinner party be like, no, I am deadly serious. I think people should be able to be murdered. And then be like, oh, you twisted my words. I didn't say that people, you definitely did, sir. We just heard you. I don't hold with the extremists who feel that there should be open season for murder all year round. Personally, I would prefer to have cut a throat week. I kind of want to cut together instead of Jimmy Stewart's like, aha, Columbo monologue at the end that is okay. Would love to cut in Divine's speech from Pink Flamingos when she's like, condone first degree murder, kill everyone, you know, just like insert the John Waters like irony into this. Oh my God, movie. sure. Is there no wrong? There is right and there is wrong. I have never been wrong. Could you give us some of your political beliefs? Kill everyone now. Condone first degree murder. Advocate cannibalism. Eat shit. Filth are my politics. Filth is my life. Now, the John Waters rope, I am <gasps> here for that movie. Oh, and even just if you just wrote it, did you think you were God, Brandon? I am God. And it did a play. <gasps> I would yes. love that. Because so I think then much. you really get the dark twistedness of John oh, Waters yeah. that fits this story. And if oh. it is just fucked and it's like a character study on the sociopaths of the upper crust New York gay, that's fascinating. I'd be intrigued by it. What about, I'll do you one... Uh -huh. Perhaps not better, but I'll do you one one sideways with Stillman's rope, where he did love and friendship and last days yeah. of disco. All those yeah. like upper crust yuppies, right? And then it's I'm right. It would Maybe. also be great. There is right and there is wrong. I have never been wrong. Okay, great. Or Mary okay. Heron, who did American Psycho. <gasps> that could be good. Anyway, I yeah. think you could yeah. remake this movie and. and that because it does feel restrained, even though it is in some yes. way his darkest movie and like it's, it's like very fucked and for the time yeah. is very ahead of its time. It also feels like right. it's on a leash, you know? Uh, definitely. God, I also kind of want Joe Wright to not direct, but maybe just do no. cinematography. <laughs> just get a cinematographer then. <laughs> but I'm just thinking of like his waters and stuff, but whatever, you know, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. But also maybe you don't do that. Like maybe that was... That was because then, like obviously this, is now. this was the beginning of the like this was not even a oneer because the technology didn't allow it right right and now at this point it's like we've seen that a million times it doesn't have the same gravitas although I do think that it's like 3D sometimes it can be useful 
right. to tell a story in a certain way, but when it's particular. Like, if you're just doing it as a gimmick, then it's just a gimmick. The reason that this movie, to me, is so much more engaging than, like, Birdman, right? Which, I liked Birdman fine, I think. It was one of those Oscar sure. movies that I watched and was like, oh, cool! Never oh. thought about it again until this moment, and it's disappeared from my memory banks. Where that But felt, now I hear drum beats, drum rolls drum in my head and, again. Yeah. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm. But anyway, just that, that he almost um, tied his hands behind his back. Oh, Hitchcock, the master of camera angles and visuals and this sure. and that. And how does he make a movie that takes place in one room over the course of a dinner party so fucking suspenseful? <laughs> yep. So, yeah, bro. I, what, I don't know. Do you have anything else you want to say about it? I wish we could have seen the bedroom. Ooh, too controversial. They couldn't even show right. a toilet. Just- Poppers and lube on the bed and the, the knives. Well, that stuff was all up in Connecticut. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> we're driving up, we're staying, we're staying a few months up in Connecticut at my mom's place. Hmm. Well, he plays the piano. Oh my God. He's going to play the piano while I dispose of bodies? Dispose of a body. I mean, right? What was their plan to get the body down to the car? I still did not understand that one. They were going to wait till it was dark and have uh-huh. the car pulled around to a, I'm assuming, a deserted area of the parking garage and then carry him down in some sort of rug or trunk or sheet or Or something. maybe the trunk. I guess just bring him in the trunk. Yeah. Oh, we're oh, slipping well. down this trunk. You know, we got to pack heavy for Connecticut winter, for Connecticut. you know? Connecticut. Well, here, you can relax. I have to take it up to the country. There have been several burglaries and mothers have been on edge. You know, it wasn't a great plan. I did love, though. So Jimmy Stewart gives a not very rousing speech about morality and you know i was wrong and you're like oh that's disappointing and he fires the gun and the police are coming farley granger's despondently oh we're fucked i'm drunk i'm a mess i had a nervous breakdown and if you notice brandon's just pouring a drink like i got this like he still thinks he's above it all by the end he has not learned one lesson he's just like oh this nonsense it's true. I mean, in some ways, though, you still wonder, what's the sequel to Rope? Could he, in theory, kill Jimmy Stewart? And then when the police arrive, say, oh, thank God you got here. He attacked us. He strangled our friend David, who showed up after our friends were here for dinner. He finally showed up late. And then this guy went crazy and he was starting to and shoot. he's and, the and one and that was always God's... talking about murdering people. Put it all off on him. Now he's dead. I love that. I love that. Yes. That's what happened. (laughs) There you go. I love it. The sequel. So, continuing on our train ride. Uh, It wasn't a great transition, but... um, Okay, another another stop on the Hitchcock train. Woo, woo. We're here to talk about 1951's Strangers on a Train. Starring Polly Granger, Robert Walker... Patricia Hitchcock, who we will get into. Obsessed. I am so incredibly obsessed with her. We will spend most of this review talking about her. Strangers on a Train, based on the now famous Patricia Highsmith novel of, you know, two strangers meeting and swapping murders, Criss Cross. Your wife, my father, Criss Cross. It's been in every procedural TV show at this point, the Criss Cross. Sure. And and they go... Is just like strangers on a train. They often will uh, directly tell you what they're referencing. Reference it. Just Good. in case you Good. didn't know. You take mine, I'll take yours. What are you getting at, Kessel? Strangers on a train. Farley Granger, Robert Walker. They meet in a club car. Plot to exchange murders. You kill my father, I'll kill your wife. I recently read this novel. So I can give you a little snippet into the, the differences. Yeah, the comparison. Most notably, I suppose, is that Guy is an architect in the book, not a tennis pro. Oh. And he, So how is he recognized? It's like, there was an article about you, up-and-coming architect. <laughs> Building that skyscraper in Manhattan. Okay. He's an up-and-coming architect, so... And it, maybe part of it is because he's dating the senator's daughter or something like that. I, I forget right, exactly, maybe, maybe. but he's in the papers. Sure. In the book, Guy fully murders the dad. Wow. But they could allow that in a movie. They could not allow that in a movie. So, I mean, he is greatly remorseful about it and has a lot of internal conflict. He's not like, yay, I murdered that guy. 
but uh, he does in fact go through with it and murder him. The overt homosexuality of Bruno is much more overt in the book. Mm, that was not um, something that was added for the film. It is pretty obvious. But there's not, it's not reciprocated in the book or is no. it kind of like a, okay. Because, okay, so in the book you are in Guy's head. So it's much more like, oh no, this crazy person is trying to convince me to do these Murder things. His father. It's less like, do I like him? But in a movie, you know, you can kind of like go. Right. You're like, oh, they are kind of friendly on this train. What's going and... on behind those eyes, Farley? But in the book, it's like he's pretty explicitly uh, gay, like uh, Bruno is. Which is like a kind of a running theme in Patricia Highsmith's novels. She um. was a lesbian and I guess frequently uh, fell in love with straight women. And so that was sort of like a running conflict that ran through. Uh, like talented Mr. Ripley, he's like kind of in love with Jude Law, oh. um, you know, like, but he's straight, and, eh, what's going on? You know, that's kind of, what, you don't remember that movie? I, I didn't see it. Oh, okay, well, anyway. Um, I love Marge. You love me, you're not marrying me. Tom, I don't love you. No, I, I don't mean that as a threat. But guy, I like you. It's like that RuPaul song. Remember the one we always laugh at, where there's like that spoken word interlude where it's like, oh. sometimes you find yourself in love with someone else and they're in love with a completely different person. A completely different and person. And that someone else actually had their eyes on a completely different person. It's really sad. <laughs> anyway, yes. I mean, obviously, translating a book to the screen, there's other things that are different, but those are sort of that, the... Big ticket the big items. Yeah. I mean, I would say that he definitely is explicitly... Well, it's pretty clear that he is flamboyant. I would assume that he's gay. Bruno, I mean, the the, the first shot of the, the shoes kind of tells you everything you need to know, right? How coded and subtextualized was this? The shoes yeah. <laughs> and more shoes. Shoes, shoes, shoes. And the kicking of... Oh, hey. Of the kicking oh, of the shoes. Oh, excuse me, yeah. Oh, excuse yeah. me. And you do notice that Guy kicks him. I'm just putting it out there. A little footsie. A little footsie. Anyway, from Hitchcock's point of view, um, he was explicitly gay. Robert Walker and him worked out a series of gestures and mannerisms that were like, he's a homosexual. How do we get this past the Hays Code? <laughs> gotcha. It was, it was calculated and he was absolutely gay and everyone knew. It wasn't a Jimmy Stewart situation. Everybody knew. <laughs> But of course, I couldn't do it, you understand. I mean, it would be too risky. And besides, it would make me a, an accessory. General plot back breakdown is that they are two strangers that meet on the train, and Bruno is kind of crazy and says, don't you want to get rid of your wife? And we yet can another, get rid of my father. Yet another person trying to figure out the perfect murder, you might say? Yes, I mean, it is the obsession with the perfect murder. An intellectual, you know, trying to, to nail down the perfect murder. So then Bruno goes ahead and murders poor Miriam. And oh, um, Miriam, I love Miriam, by the way. Did you? I mean, because she's just such, such a bitch. I could be very pathetic as the deserted little mother in a courtroom. Guy, think it over. I was excited to see such a bitch in a movie. It was great. Yeah, she's pretty cold hearted and manipulative and... You well, know. and to show, well, okay, so yes, Farley Granger has an estranged wife. Uh, he wants a divorce. She's sort of like, you're getting rich now on this pro circuit. Maybe I'm going to keep you Milk in this you. marriage. <laughs> I'm not getting a divorce. You little double crosser. I didn't want this divorce. You did. That's what you've been harping about for the past year. It's a woman's privilege to change your mind. Yeah. And th the fact that they explicitly state that she is pregnant with another man's baby, I thought was yeah. very taboo for the time. Uh, skip it, Miriam. It's pretty late to start flirting with a discarded husband. Especially when you're going to have another man's baby. Yeah, well, it's interesting, the casting of Farley Granger for this role, and maybe in some ways it makes sense. He, to me, he reads so gay. I don't know what that means, but like he just does. There's just something, too, about this role where it's so weak or also just so like trapped, right? He's trapped by Miriam, then he gets trapped by Bruno. It's not my baby. Yes, but people don't know that guy, do they? And I'm assuming that at the time there was not like DNA paternal, you know, testing that you could be like, oh. Um, no, Montel Williams was not yet on the air. <laughs> right, 
Right. I mean, there may have been, so, I bet it was very expensive and time consuming. And by that time, the tabloids would have already had it and et cetera. Right. So. His intended marriage to Anne would be completely ruined. Oh. And, you know. We'll talk about Anne. We will talk about Anne. You didn't? <laughs> um, I think she's so dull that they deserve each other. I think it actually, I think it works in the movie, but I was having the same feelings, right? I was like, oh, guys, so like whatever. And Bruno's so interesting. And I mean, that's the best. Movies have interesting villains. Ideally, the right. heroes would also be interesting as well. But then I was thinking about it more and I was like, oh, he is this pretty playboy tennis player that hasn't really had to deal with anything in his life. He's he's just kind of coasted by on his looks and his talent, you know, his tennis talent, his prowess or whatever. Um, he hasn't right. had to like deal with anything. And this is the first time sure. in his life really, Miriam was the first challenge, you know, and now it's Bruno, where he's had to like confront something. You mad, crazy maniac. You ought to be locked up. Will you get out of here and let me alone? Being a more evolved person for having strife. Sure. Uh, sure. So I kind of read it like that, and it made it, him a little more interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he's the most exciting or interesting person, but I do think part of that is almost beneficial. Well, he has to be able to be trapped. Like, if he was... I guess they wanted William Holden, or Hitchcock wanted William Holden to play Guy. He would just be like, get out of here. No sure. thanks. But Guy... I'm not interested. <laughs> guy... A per, you know, a person who's never had to deal with conflict, it seems, right. is like, sure, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you think my theory's okay, Guy? You like it? Sure, bro, sure. They're all okay. Yeah, I'm just being polite, exactly, and, and say, we're all cool. And then Bruno's like, ah, we are all cool, okay. We're cool, um, right, Guy? Oh my God, do we speak the same language? Gay? You Are know. we <laughs> driving up to Connecticut later? You know. <laughs> guy. Over here, guy. No, but I do think that the blank slateness, blank slateness of Guy it sounded also like he allows. Said, I'm sorry, it sounded like you said Blake Slate, like it was his name. I did. And now I, I kind I, of love that for some dumb Hallmark movie that we write where there's like a a generic action hero. His name is Blake Slate. I like Blake that. Blake Slate. I like that Anyway, a lot. continue. The fact that uh, Farley Granger is a blank slate. Allows the audience to s not necessarily see themselves in him, but to see themselves in that situation, right? It, right. it becomes yes. a placeholder for anyone watching to be like, oh my God, what if I was stuck in this situation? What if I got, you know, somehow by being polite, got caught up in this crazy situation? Is there with someone a, a, in my life that I want to murder? Everyone has somebody that they want to put out of the way. Oh, now, surely, madam, you're not going to tell me that there hasn't been a time that you didn't want to dispose of someone? Your husband, for instance? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, Mrs. Cunningham, blood everywhere? Oh. I suppose I'll have to get a gun from somewhere. Oh, no, Mrs. Cunningham. Bang, bang, bang all over the place. Blood everywhere. <laughs> Knock him on the head with a hammer, pour gasoline over him and over the car, and set the whole thing ablaze. <laughs> You'd have to walk home on your You'd own? You'd have to walk home? No. no I no. guess I just <laughs> I set the car on fire. No. Oh. No. Oh, I did it wrong. I didn't do the murder right. You don't mind if I borrow your neck for a moment, do you? Oh, it is not for long. I want to talk about the composer, Dimitri Tvomkin. Uh, I'm doing my best. <laughs> It's fantastic, but he did the score for a couple of really good movies that I want to highlight. Mad Love with Peter Lorre, where he's um, an obsessed mad scientist who he puts the hands of a serial killer onto the woman he's obsessed with boyfriend because he loses his hands in a tragic accident. And then the hands come alive and Kill. so... Oh, it's so good. So It's so good. From like 1935 or something. Oh my God. If you want to see Peter Lorre just doing it all. He believes he murdered his father. <laughs> Foul suggestion. 
You gotta watch Mad Love. But he also did You Can't Take It With You, Only Angels Have Wings, It's a Wonderful Life, huh? Red River, talk oh. about hom homoerotic subtext. Can I see it? Maybe you'd like to see mine. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, hey, that's good too. Come on, keep it going. What was all that shooting a while back? It was having some fun. <laughs> Peculiar kind of fun. Sizing each other up for the future. Uh, he did Shadow of a Doubt, another Hitchcock movie, Dial M for Murder. And, oh, and another, I know this is a lot, but they're so good. Another noir movie that doesn't get enough credit called Angel Face with Robert Mitchum and Gene Simmons. Not that Gene Simmons, oh. the other Gene Simmons. Although. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Gene with a J. That movie is wild. So good. So anyway, Dimitri, bravo to you. The soundtrack is amazing. But this movie also marks the first collaboration with Hitchcock and Robert Burks, his cinematographer, that basically he did from this movie clear through Marnie. I, he didn't do wow. Psycho, which was interesting. I was like, oh, of all the ones to skip, uh, he must have been huh. busy. Something was going busy. on. But like, yeah, all of the famous ones, uh, he did them. Brian and I were laughing that it just seems like Hitchcock can never capture a staircase at a regular angle. Oh, but of course not. Why? Why would you? He's always cool. trying to perfect, you know, grow uh, from one thing to the next. I was, I was kind of comparing him to like a Stephen King, right? Where he's, he's invented an entire universe. You know, people will be like, oh, Stephen King's always repeating himself. But it's like, oh, that's because he invented the world first and now he's playing in it. And he's trying to perfect right. it every time doing the same fucking thing. But it gets better every time. I certainly admire people who do things. What a great opening line. Oh, I certainly admire people who do things. Just perfectly encapsulates Bruno's character. Done. Yes. Well, then what does he say to you about, oh, my father, he has all this money and he wants me to... I catch the 8-5 bus every morning, punch a time clock somewhere, and work my way up selling paint or something. We should talk about Robert, Robert Walker for a little bit of time because he really is the driving force of this movie and is so yeah. incredibly fantastic. Evil... Uh, charismatic, funny. I mean, when he pops that little kid's balloon. <laughs> bang, bang. <laughs> oh my God, right? I was like, I want a gif of that. Just like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also I want that lobster tie. Oh my God, right? Yeah. Loved that. Loved that. <laughs> so yes, they meet on the train and Robert Walker decides that he's going to go through with his master plan to commit the perfect murder by murdering Guy's wife without his knowledge or his consent or his confusing consent. Oh, we do talk the same language, don't we? Well, sure, Bruno, we talk the same language. Thanks for the lunch. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I think that's what's interesting, right? Is that it's just enough of, well, you wanted me to do it which is not really untrue, but at right. the same time, it's so sociopathic. Well, it reminded me of, there's this Ian McEwan book called Enduring Love, and then they made a movie about it too, that's about this syndrome called, I, I'm gonna say it wrong probably, but it's called something like de Clermbeau or something. It's like de Clermbeau. And it's this disease where you think someone is in love with you by like subtle, things they're doing like you read into everything and become increasingly more obsessed with this person and so i think in the in the original case it was like i want to say she was in love with the king at the time or something and so the curtains would always be opened at this time and she had invented in her mind that that meant that he was still in love with her there was all these like you know things that that right. she was inventing or reading into that were not happening it reminded me of that actually a lot where he's just like but we totally had this conversation and you said i should definitely right. do it right you know and it's like oh no yeah but it's still there's enough of a kernel of truth there where you're like well he did want it's not not too. true yeah is it and i mean and that's patricia hitchcock right that's our truth sayer Miriam went there with two boys they're the ones who found it so they're not suspects but you probably will be one doesn't always have to say what one thinks Father, I am not a politician. I'm not a politician, Dad. I was so obsessed with her. I love her so much. She's my favorite part of this movie. Pat Hitchcock yes. plays Guy's new girlfriend's sister, Long right. Walk, 
who is also obsessed with murder. Is she? Oh, yeah. Remember when she's talking to... Guy, did you know Mr. Hennessy helped track that axe murder I was reading about? You know, the one where the body was cut up and hidden in the butcher shop. He was locked in the icebox with the left leg for six hours. I think by the end of the movie, she's learned her lesson that maybe that's... <laughs> she flew too close maybe. to the sun. But I think she's absolutely obsessed with it. Or, okay. or investigations. Right. Or I think that's... Like, like, she that. seems intellectually intrigued like she seems so smart and five steps ahead of so many people and whatever that i was just like i want her to solve this police will say guy wanted miriam out of the way so he could marry ann the crime is thought the police first go after the husband anyway and guy had every motive can she be the one that just like figures out well, how to make everything resolve neatly that would be nice so i was like guy what are you doing with ann clearly you should go fall in love with barbara she's way more awesome way more fun you'll have a great life but you want to be a boring Senator, who's going to just, loves Anne. you know, ride the line and live a normal life. It's sure. pretty boring. Can't be helped, darling. It's not your fault. It's not as though anyone can say you had anything to do with it. Barbara was so much more interesting to me. Barbara was fabulous. Oh, Daddy doesn't mind a little scandal. He's a senator. But he still gets Barbara in his life, so there you go. And then sure. he gets to, to fuck Anne. That dress at that party, oh, oh my God. Fabulous. So gorgeous. I mean, don't get me wrong. She looks stunning. Ruth Roman is a beautiful woman. I just think she was kind of, you know, plain toast in this movie. She's sort of like, I'm here. I'm your doting woman. What? You might have murdered your wife. Oh, no, darling. That means that we can't be together. Even more terrifying than the murder itself was the horrible thought that if you had had anything to do with it, we would have been separated, perhaps forever. Instead of saying, for a second I thought you murdered her and I was going to be very upset because I thought that you had murdered her, she says, then we couldn't be together, darling. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> for a and, second I thought you were a murderer and then we couldn't be together. Not, for a second I thought you were a murderer and then I was dating a murderer. And that was, ups and that was upsetting to me because, no. And you need to get your no. priorities straight. Anna. I still think it'd be wonderful to have a man love you so much he'd kill for you. Every line that came out of her mouth, I was like, yes, yes. bitch. <laughs> Wait, we haven't talked about Bruno's mom, and I feel like that's a very important conversation to have. I like them to look just right. Did I file them too short? Oh, no, Ma. They're just fine. Mary and Lorne, who plays Mrs. Antony, who also was Aunt Clara in Bewitched, I was having a, like a very deep, um, like, I know you from, oh my God, it's yeah. Bewitched. The amount yeah. of hours that I watched Bewitched, and the amount of actors that it turns out I know from Bewitched from is Bewitched. right that. up there with Frasier. It's like right up there. It's, it's either, oh, oh they were from Frasier, or, oh, it was Bewitched. Oh. But Mrs. <laughs> Antony, I mean, she might be just as certifiable as Bruno. Um, Definitely. <laughs> You're a naughty boy, Bruno. <laughs> well, you can always make me laugh. <laughs> the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I guess, you know? Oh, I was trying to paint St. Francis. That's the old boy, all right. That's father. I was trying to paint St. Francis. That scene was so fascinating. Well, you know, oh, you really should take up painting. It's so therapeutic. And then he just starts cackling at her painting. And oh. you can see her face fall. He says it looks just like father. He's he's right. cackling that it looks just like he, th he sees yeah. his father and then that dramatic sure. turn of the painting. I mean, that scene is, you know, two minutes, something, you know, whatever. And, and it's like, sure. I, I've got it. I got it all. Yes. Like, oh, yeah, I Mrs. see. Mrs. Anthony is in the movie here. for two scenes, and I feel like I know her. <laughs> yes, yes. Also, I mean, oh, my God. Honey, I really wish you would change your plans about the White House. About um, blowing up the White House. Oh, my, I was only fooling. Besides, what would the president say? Should we talk about the carnival sequence? The first of two oh. infamous yes. carnival sequences. Now, this is the first time I could be wrong that I recall seeing a movie where we see a killer stalking, actively stalking 
a woman. I mean, I, I could be very wrong, but there was something that felt really true crimey and now about yes. this scene that I don't necessarily know if that conversation was being had back then. I feel like the idea of a serial killer had yet to be defined. And so this idea of this random man just following her around and she seems like maybe she's like oh he seems like he's dressed well oh, and he's kind of cute she's i'm kind of fully into, this into guy. it she's fully into it but then there's that turn where she's like maybe i'm not or am i it, it goes really really back and forth it's really well done and it's really fascinating like especially with her where they've established i mean perhaps offensively so but they've established her promiscuity Right. Well, I will say in the book, Miriam is is described as like just an awful like it is it is much worse in the book. That's all I'd say. Like she is trash. I and mean, she's on a date with two men. Well, in the book, it's, it's a double date. But I did love that in the movie oh. they decided that she was going to be like Haha, Gary and Bob. Oh my God, let's eat ice cream. Right. Let's go in the tunnel yeah. of love and have a threesome. I don't know. Right. But then that shadow. Hey, hey, wait, wait. The rise of suspense where it's like you see his shadow consume the three of them uh -huh, and then you hear uh -huh. the scream and then it's just her being like, oh, you're such a flirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. It's what he does best. Yeah. He's following her around. He's wearing oh, right. a cupid so doll. You know, oh, he's showing his prowess and masculinity right and oh she's so into it he's the only one that can hit the bell you just want a cupid doll why he's broken the thing i think she's equally turned on by him and yeah. and the attention and i think it doesn't hurt that he is dressed like he looks expensive i think that's part of it as well. right right he, yes absolutely i'm sure yeah it's this dapper man that's you know this daddy that's looking you know Turns out she's not his type, um, but no. she didn't know that. Um, she didn't know? <laughs> How was she to know? But it was a really fascinating balance between like, ooh, who's this guy that's like so into me? And also, right. why is he so into me and following me everywhere? I would be interested to, I can't do this because I've seen this scene, but to perhaps show this scene independently of, you know, just on its own and see if it plays sure. like a rom-com. It's the beginning of the notebook you know, or whatever, right? You know, he's kind of being a jerk. Oh, I'm going to climb this thing and make a spectacle of, you know, it's like you're kind of going, do I like this or don't I like this? Go out with me. <laughs> God damn, my head's slipping. The crowd's a fire, you idiots! Not until she agrees. Oh, go out with him, honey. Okay, okay, fine. You know, he puts the lighter. Are you Miriam? Yes. And then we cut, yes. you know, obviously before he brutally sure. murders her and see what an independent mind would think. You know, are they going to uh, fall in love and get married and go back through the tunnel of love? We don't know. Write um, novels about her, you know, to remind her when she has Alzheimer's? Maybe. We don't know. You know, in a different world, in a different place, maybe Bruno and Miriam could have found some sort of mutually exclusive beard money, non-sexual uh, you know, sure. thing going on. I know? love that. Rather than rather than crisscross murders, crisscross love. You know. Yeah, I'll take her off your hands and pay for her expensive taste, and she can be my beard, so my dad will get off my back, and I can go fuck men. Exactly. You know. There you go. Crisscross. It works for everyone. Come on. <laughs> but no, that's not what happens. He uh, brutally murders her, and her glasses. This also, this oh, shot. I mean, so, I mean, it's so, the glasses so fall. And then you see in the reflection of the inside of the lenses. This yeah. fun house mirror, if you will. I love it so much. Had you seen this? Was this in your, in your... No. I mean, you hadn't seen the movie, but had you seen this shot? Oh, no, oh but... lucky you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we see yet another brutal strangulation in real time, which is upsetting. And the... <laughs> Just callousness of just walking away yeah. and all we hear is, Miriam, where are you? Stop yeah. goofing around. Oh, she fainted. Oh my God, she is dead. <laughs> and he right. just, yes. but the, the perfect joke on the end of this, but of course he helps the blind man to cross the street. He's not a monster. Of course. 
No. Part of you wonders is that is he doing that as like a sociopathic way of being like, it's oh, this cover. will make me seem yeah. Right. I think it's cover. Right. But but the joke yeah. of that of just you know maybe it's his lack of empathy. Then that he doesn't think to be like, oh gosh, what's happening over there on the island? Like what was that? I don't know. Part of it is the way that he so coolly walks away makes the boat operator notice it, and that's yeah. why he remembers it later and leads to his demise. But yes. spoiler alert. Is that because he has no empathy that he can't think? How would a a person, you know, who's trying yes. to not, who didn't just murder her, be? I don't yes, know. but I think he was also like, I just murdered her. I gotta get the fuck out of here. It's a sick, sick world that Hitchcock has created for us. Fun and games, and people get hurt. It's great. Yep, it's good, right? That's like I love it. Oh, I love it. it. That's the new category yeah. in blockbuster. You know, it's like thriller, yeah. suspense. Fun and games and people get hurt. Okay, and, that's the whole Hitchcock yeah. section. It's great. Clue is there, yeah. you know. Yeah. A, lo- a lot of things fit that category. It's great. We could talk about a returning theme of horses and sexual desire that continues throughout um, that this whole scene of them riding the carousel and he's staring at her and she thinks it's in a sexy way and he thinks it's in a I'm going to murder you and I'm excited about it kind of way. Oh, it's so dark. It's- Yeah, it is dark. Now, do we think Prom Night 2, Hello, Mary Lou, is in part homage to this? Oh, dear God, I hope so. I hope so with all of my heart. With my cinephile heart, I truly, truly hope so. Now, again, females expressing their sexual desire through horse. It's a thing. Maybe I should write a thesis on this. Maybe you should. (laughs) It comes up more than you'd think. I mean, that's true historically. Just like women were the only time they were allowed to be like alone and like away from, or shall I say, rich women who were, you know, in society were allowed to be alone and away from it all and perhaps express themselves was on a horse. So, you know. Right. Be athletic yeah. and get your blood right. pumping. All of the above. This time I want you to really grind into the saddle. I think I'm getting it. Faster, 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 faster. There's something well, here. And physically, Physically you know. also, yes, obviously. But the band plays on. Can we briefly talk about Fuck Island? I don't know what we're like. Oh my God. Yes. So they go through the tunnel of love onto Tom Sawyer's Island, which is just, you know, they're going to watch the submarine races and um, (laughs) fuck. I mean, what was the plan? Was Miriam going to fuck both of them? I think so. I think so. And you know what? Good for her. I mean, that is how she got pregnant, probably. But like. Right. I mean, contraception was not really readily available. But anyway, perfect place for a murder. Yes. I think it's time that we really delve into Mrs. Cunningham and her diamond necklace. She's the one that he strangles at the party. Oh, oh, oh my God. Yes. Oh my gosh. So that's Norma Varden, who I knew mostly from, she plays Mrs. Uh, Lady Beekman from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. You might be interested in my tiara. I always carry it with me, afraid to leave it in the stateroom. For some reason, I've seen that movie like way, way, way more than others. You might know her from, she's in Sound of Music. She plays Frau Schmidt. Does that ring a bell? Frau Schmidt? No. We'll find her. Maybe she's wearing a fabulous diamond necklace and plays the exact same part. Uh, Fräulein Maria, Mm. I'm Frau Schmidt, the housekeeper. How do you do? Uh, How do you do? I'll show you to your room. Follow me. That name does sound familiar. Like when you said it, I was like, I feel like that sounds familiar. She was not on Bewitched. I, I looked. Ah, shoot. But we're at the fancy dress party and oh Bruno has uh, snuck in. Sorry to pause yeah. you, no, but no, no, I no. did find it really weird and, and confusing, I guess, that he's like, ah, this is the perfect plan in that no one knows that we have ever met and therefore there's no motive. Meanwhile... Well, After I murder your wife, I will then show up and stalk you everywhere and appear in public with you and many other people, thereby linking us publicly. It's a flaw in his character, but he says 
you wouldn't return my phone calls. I had to bring it out. You know, I, ha I had to talk to you somehow. So it's like he's tying his own noose and is being dumb. Sure. But he kind of says like, right. well, you wouldn't do what I was saying. I mean, oh my God, when he's, when he's in gay alley across the street, guy, guy. Oh my God, right. Hello, guy. What are you doing here at this time of night? Well, you don't seem very pleased to see me. Guy, come over. Come over to my shadowy What's corner. That? What's that now? What's happening? What's over here? You've got me acting like a criminal. I mean, well, that was what was so... I, I think that's what's fun about this one is that you really are just like, well, what would I do? What do you right. say or whatever? I mean, I, I get frustrated with these kind of plot points and stuff where you're like, well, you just tell the truth and then... But like this one was... This one covers the bases where you, you go, well, he can't really. Why didn't you call the police? And have them say what you did. Mr. Haynes, how did you get him to do it? And Bruno would say we planned it together. He's really yeah. trapped. Ooh, your you know? alibi was drunk and doesn't remember you at all? You know. Ooh. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah, in the book there was much more of a trial. It was much more like he's on trial for the murder and he has to keep going back oh. to Medcalf. And it was much more of that. I'm glad, good adaptation then it sounds like, that we got more tennis. We had to have a really long tennis match though. A very lengthy. I feel like every time I watch this movie, I forget how long that scene is. I go, they're still playing tennis. He's still trying to get that yeah. lighter out of that sewer yeah. grate. Oh my God, right? I mean, it doesn't cross <laughs> over to me too painfully, you know, too long. I think because the same thing, you know, it's not like, and also this is happening and the Gungans are fighting the, the you know, and also they're trying to break sure. out of the palace and he's flying around them and trying to, it's not too many things happening at once. So right, no, it's it. just, it's just meanwhile, meanwhile, and he's racing the clock and he's racing the clock and they're both trying to, you know, get to the island. I did sort of love the, the commentator, the tennis commentator that was just like... Guy Haynes is hitting harder, hurrying up to play, taking chances I've never seen him take. This is a complete reversal of his usual watch and wait strategy. Did Bruno inadvertently like make him a better tennis player because he forced him to confront things and evolve and have right. strife in his life and have to like be dead, you know, they, they describe his tennis playing much like his character. He's lackadaisical. He waits for them to come to him and sort of sees what yep. happens. And I'm like, well, that's his character. And this is the turn yeah. when it's like, oh, suddenly he has to oh. make a fucking decision. He has to go on the offensive. He has to actually take, yeah. you know, control of things. But Mrs. Cunningham. Mrs. Cunningham. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, my God, <laughs> Mrs. Cunningham. That's right. That's where this all began. So we're at the party. I'm sorry. And, of course, they're discussing murder at the party. I think next time I go to a party, whenever the fuck that will be, I think I'm going to talk about murder. Oh, my God, right? So, should we talk about oh. the perfect murder? How would you do it? How would you do it? Let's talk about it. But this turn of, you know, oh, this funny scene is going on, and they're talking about murder, and oh, oh, oh everything's light and gay. Poison could take anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks if poor Mr. Cunningham is going to die from natural causes. <laughs> this is so haunting. He's... He's like, I mean, I love the idea that, that this was in some way acceptable. Here, let me show you how I can strangle you at this party. And no one notices. He goes into a feat, a feat of rage and uh, is staring at Patricia Hitchcock because she has the same, not the same, but almost the same glasses. And that push in on her and her face. Oh, that's so good. And then he faints. I think he um, is overcome with... Um, Overdid it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, overexert. You can only strangle someone, you know, maybe twice a month. It's hard. Well, it seems like this is his first murder, in all honesty. Yes, uh, indeed. But it didn't seem like it would be his last were he not caught. Well, certainly that. Although you could argue in some way that he also seemed somewhat regretful. I think that was the, what we were supposed to see in like him seeing Miriam's face right. in... Patricia Hitchcock again was that like he's um, he's replaying it and feeling like there's some sort of guilt there perhaps I don't know I read it that he was remembering it and liking it and wanting to do more that was that's how I read it because he lost control oh. and either way the funniest scene no one of the funniest scenes when Ruth Roman and then goes to his mom and is basically I was like what was the plan girl she's like right. so your son murdered my boyfriend's wife because they 
met on a train and he's like a full psycho so can you just like go ahead and turn your son into the police and that would be great because then like my boyfriend can get off of it and like it won't be a big deal and we can like go get married is that something that right. you'd be like into or what do you think your son is responsible for a woman's death did Beryl tell you this well, of course not mrs anthony well there you are <laughs> <laughs> Well, how do you know that he did it? Did he tell did you? Did Bruno tell you that? No. But Mrs. Anthony, you have to make him do something about this. Don't you see that just one word from him would get Guy out of this dreadful situation? Like, what was that conversation? You've never met me, a stranger. Right. I'm coming into your house, and I would like to tell you that your son is a psychopath. Also, he's murdered someone that you've never met and don't know about. Also, I'm a stranger. Um, what do you think? Can you turn him into the police so my boyfriend can be free? Yeah, Anne doesn't have a lot to do. I guess she's the pretty older sister of a rich patriarch and is, you know, was yep. trained her whole life to get married and be a nice politician's wife. Oh, but uh, speaking about Barbara, because um, we could talk about her till the end of time, I did love yep. her distraction to get when the police throws away talk from or whatever all over his crotch i think it was supposed to be makeup but um oh, powder it was powder yeah and she's just just patting his penis just patting that penis yeah. on on her knees right. just, just oh, sorry i love it really <laughs> oh it's such a class oh my god sorry about it, <laughs> it so i kind of want them to like get together in the end and then they can have like a yeah. sitcom spin-off where he's a cop and it's like, Allah, I love Lucy. And she's like, I'm trying to help you solve the case. And he's like, Barbara. <laughs> Barbara, please. Please, Barbara. I would prefer it to be more like the Thin Man series, where it's just like the two of them, <gasps> oh, and she's the brains, and he's the brawn. Love that. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> they have a cute dog, you know. Yeah, they got Asta the dog. It's great. I oh, love that. Yeah. Oh, well, speaking of Patricia Hitchcock, she recently died in August at 93 of natural causes in her sleep. I mean, bravo, Good for her. Patricia, bravo. She really always stuck out in this movie as as the star. And I always oh, gravitate absolutely. towards the Hitchcock characters that are just like on board. You need me to help you escape from the police? Yes, I will do that. Oh no, please. Anne says you must have dinner with us tonight. Just the family. Okay, so we haven't really talked about when Guy goes to Bruno's house to murder his yes. dad. He's climbing up the stairs. <gasps> There's a scary dog. There's a weird slow motion shot that, you know, we can forgive. It's 1951, but whatever. Creeping into the bedroom and, you know, Mr. Anthony, Mr. Anthony, I've got to tell you, your son <gasps> is right here in a yeah. full tux. I love that he was like, I'm still in my tails. Right? Yeah, of course. Look, Bruno, you're terribly sick. Bruno, you're sick. Like, to just tell someone yeah. so blatantly. It reminded me right. of Sleepaway Camp when they were like, Angela, why are you so fucked up? Yo, Angela, how come you're so fucked up? I mean, like, what's your problem? Oh, well, I mean, we didn't talk about probably the most famous shot from this movie. I was saying he kind of gave me, like, Kevin Spacey vibes mixed Robert with... Robert um, Yeah, yeah. Mixed with Bill Murray... And Kevin Spacey, like, blended together. Well, it was interesting because um, before this, Robert Walker was in more, like, romantic, nice roles. This was sort of out of the box mm -hmm. for him, for his career. And um, it worked great. Hitchcock handpicked him. He was like, you're the guy. Wow. You're the guy. You're the only guy I wanted. You're the guy. Guy is heading back to Fuck Island to get his lighter back, this MacGuffin. And, yeah. oh, this scene is so great. So... Guy has shown up at the carnival. Bruno's already at the carnival. There's a long line to Fuck Island because yeah. after the murder, everyone wants to go check it out. My business he's doing over there since the murder. People want to see the scene of the crime. There was that whole conversation between Bruno and, and the, the janitor or whatever guy who was like, oh, well, it tanked after the murder. Business fell off something terrible for a while. The smoochers wouldn't go near the place. And now everyone seems to want to go where... Well, like, I think it was, was like... You know, the next day people are like, I don't want to go there. I don't want to get murdered. And then sure. it was sort of like, wait, isn't that where Ooh, that chick got murdered? Murder Let's go yeah. and check that out. That just morbid fascination that people seem to have. You know, it's like that same conversation of like, right. you know, he says, oh, isn't it fucked up? Like, isn't that messed up that like they're making money off of, you know, all of these people going to see this murder and it's so bleak or whatever. And he's like, well, everyone's got to make money somehow or whatever. That's right. all so cynical and, and it could be... 
one of the conversations in any of these dinner parties or any of this other stuff that has been oh, had yes. in both of these movies. Yeah. And yet it's like some carnival It seems like, the, um, you know, the end of uh, Pinocchio, right? What, what's that called? Sure. That's called yeah, something um, island, Pleasure too. island. Pleasure Island. Pleasure Island. Ooh. Well, I mean, there you go. That's, that's where they went. That's where Miriam got killed on Pleasure Island, right? We just got to add a couple of donkey noises and we're there. Anyway, yes, Bruno is waiting in line for a boat, this shadowy like, shot yeah. of him by himself, and the tension is building, guys getting there, we know the cops are coming, everyone's culminating at this carousel. Now, this really is the police's fault, right? We're going to just put that right, I- right ahead on them. Hold it! The cop fully just shoots into a crowd of of children yeah. and women and innocent yeah. bystanders and shoots yeah. the carousel operator. And this runaway carousel scene is so fucking oh great. God. So this is from, this is not in the book at all. This is from a different book oh. called The Moving Toy Shop. It was like a completely oh. different mystery series. So take that for what you will. But I love this sequence so Oh, fucking much. My favorite part is they're spinning out of control and oh God, they're fighting and there's horses or whatever. And the mother is standing on the side going, my son, my son. And it cuts to the son and he's having the time of his life. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like he's just having the best. And that is so perfectly Hitchcock. The manic, just freneticness of this scene and the editing and... The horses and the hooves are coming Mini down guillotines. on them. Mini little, yeah. little guillotines. And all of the terror. Yeah, all of the terror. I mean, it, well, first of all, a few things. One, why does the carousel have this speed? Why did they build this carousel to fly into space? I don't know, but they did, and that's where we're at. I think the safety you know, precautions of carnivals was like right. a lot less uh, OSHA, yeah. monitored yeah. back then, you know. As a... Sure. Again, this suspense where it's like you're watching this old guy crawl underneath this super fast moving planks. And meanwhile, there's all this craziness going on above them. And then he just stops to like, ooh, so sweaty. This is a <laughs> harrowing situation right now. That was a real stunt. And apparently Hitchcock closed his eyes the whole time because he was convinced it was going to go wrong. He said he would never do anything that dangerous again. He was terrified. It was like a whole, whole big thing. But yeah, the combination of like this, the rear projection and the miniatures and it it still looks so good. I think, I mean, it looks fantastic. And this, you know, essentially metaphoric sex scene between them, I want to say, I mean, it's all culminating, let's say to a climax of them finally getting physical. I mean, we don't know. There's more gray area in the movie with whether or not Farley Granger perhaps is passing as a straight man and is trying to mm. live a normal life, right? And But Bruno maybe sees something in him. And, right, right. And, you know, you could read into it and that Bruno can't hide. He's too flamboyant to hide, you know, how he really feels or whatever. You can read into it. I don't know if it's there, but somehow having Farley Granger play him helps because he really is right. just so good. So pretty and so gay. But the gleeful like juxtaposition of, you know, the the happiest place. Oh, I'm on the carousel and the horses and this beautiful imagery. Right. And then like the terror of like, oh my God, like that right. woman. They kept coming back to this one woman that I was really enjoying. She had a big scarf on and she was, yes. she was really playing it up and I enjoyed it quite a bit. So then he stops it, I guess, in such a dramatic way that... He stops it so quickly. I'm amazed that anyone is alive. Oh, for sure. They definitely had some casualties. Let's say that. <laughs> I mean, I guess casualties. he did die. Bruno did die. But Bruno like, Bruno did die. <laughs> you thought it was dangerous with them spinning. It's more dangerous now that the entire carousel has crashed and dissolved into a pile yeah, of rubble. You really needed to take it down notch by notch and slowly through centrifugal, centrifugal. Yeah. Centrifugal. Now you say aluminum, we say aluminium. You say centrifugal, we say centrifugal. You say herbs, and we say herbs because there's a fucking H in it. <laughs> Slow it on down, but you know, yeah. movie. Right. <laughs> and then the old man, notch by notch, slowly right. slowed down. And they, Bruno and him finally got to have a conversation where they really broke yeah. it down and talked about their love of horses and all of men. Love, you know, men. Yeah. 
Hawks, you know, whatever, the Connecticut countryside, whatever it was, meeting of the minds. Uh, but no, oh, yeah. Bruno is killed. No. And to the end, he won't give it up. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't, I don't have right. a lighter. I don't, uh, right. it seemed like a pretty bad I tried plan, to, ha- I, you know, <laughs> yeah. they're going to find it, Bruno. I think they're going to find it. It's in your hand. So then it's like, finally, I guess he has some sort of evidence to show that he was telling the truth. And I guess it helped. It, the the boat, biggest thing that helped that the boat guy, the boat guy recognized him. It was like, I've never seen this one in my life, but that guy, he was here the right. night that she was murdered. Because without that, it's really just like, well, you're still probably going to be uh, tried for accessory to murder. Or... Things look bad for me, don't they? I'm what you call an accessory. Or something, right, exactly. Like, you can't prove in any way, shape, or form that you didn't have anything to do with it. Technically, they could still say you convinced him to do it. Like, just because he, the boat guy had never seen him, he could still be tried right. as an accessory. That is true. Right. Well, now that he's dead, there's no way. I mean, it, it still would have been a he said, he said, but yeah. Maybe there's Mrs. Not really maybe any Mrs. Way Anthony will come forward and her paintings will be part of the evidence that they can oh put God, up and it'll that. be fabulous. Yeah. Oh my God, silly. And then this, this tacked on ending that I hate. I wish it just ended with the lighter, right? And it was a story right. about Bruno and Guy and whatever was going on between them. That's what it was about. But no, we have to get Anne, you know, desperately waiting right. for his call. Oh my God, you're really not a murderer? Yay, now we can be married. And then this train scene with the priest and like, ha everything's great now. We're not permanently damaged by all this trauma. It's fine. Right. Well, I mean, I guess they are permanently damaged because it's like, oh, aren't you guy? And they're like, her face is pretty much, it says everything where it's just like, we have to go. Aren't you guy, Haynes? The ending is disappointing, but, you know, doesn't ruin the movie by any means. It's a product of its time. Both of the endings for Rope and this are happy i guess you know as much as you can be after a vicious murder they don't go super bleak in terms of like society or people as a whole you know which is nice for me it makes it a little bit more fun and games and someone gets hurt and not just like oh people get hurt and people are fucked up but sometimes you can have some fun different vibe yeah different vibesies certainly certainly well that is strangers on a train i'm so excited you got to see it for the first time that is like so incredibly yeah. exciting to me <laughs> <laughs> i love that it's true it's true because i mean i haven't seen these movies for the first time since middle school so it's like very exciting wow. these these i was completely and utterly obsessed with hitchcock and so i watched them over and over and over and over again so it's like cool to be like I'm sharing this thing that I love with you and you've never experienced it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's fun. It's like Sleepaway Camp. Oh, boy. Yes. <laughs> now, if there was a horseback riding scene in Sleepaway Camp, we'd really have something to talk about. That's true. Yeah. Well, cheers to John Dahl and to Patricia yes. Hitchcock. Oh, my God. Yes. Yo, Angela, how come you're so fucked up? I mean, like, what's your problem? 